Throughout. Hopefully this will be interactive, understanding that with a larger audience, uh, it's hard to stay on that intimate level, but we definitely want to entertain any questions as we go along. Um, does this work here? Yep. Oh, fantastic. Okay. To start with, I'd like you just to kind of put your hands down for a minute and imagine that you have... Uh, just come back from the other side of the mountain, gone on a hiking trip, and you've seen something on the other side of that mountain that has the potential to save 200 million lives, and no one else has seen it. Just imagine that. You have this information that could impact, for good, 200 million people. And now you come back... How would you feel, and what would you do with that information? Well, as, as Eric and I have kind of come together and, and have this, what we call the pie in the sky idea, what we're seeing is this opportunity to bless not only 200 million, but millions beyond that. Half of the world's population... Thank you. So we're going to go over introduction. We're going to talk about Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and the curve. Has, has Craig talked about the curve and the point of service? Did he talk about that? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to talk about that curve uh, specifically in this, in this class. And then this puzzle. You, microfinance, Dr. Eunice, technology that's out there now, action. Uh, all of you are in this business college. Uh, you're taking this course from a, a college that is going to teach you about business. And that is a key kernel to not only your prosperity, but also the prosperity of this 200 million people. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll also talk about uh, some social entrepreneurship and making a difference from the left side of the curve. So let's talk what exactly uh, is the left side and so on. First introduction. Myself. Um, I'm a Salt Lake City native, born and raised in Holiday, Utah. Go Olympus Titans, that's me. Uh, I'm also a BYU of, uh, alumni of mechanical engineering. Uh, so I came here, went through these classes. I think I may have sat in this room a few times, had that whole experience. Um, and then I went to the Philippines on my mission. And I saw two things. I saw some great memories. So here's what great memories look like to me in the Philippines. We had great birthday parties. The Philippines has this great tradition that if it's your birthday, you give gifts away. So we would always attend as many birthdays as we could. Um, got plenty of good food. Beautiful countryside. One of the greatest memories that I had was looking at a mountain that was just full of palm trees. And I have that vision in my mind. It's so beautiful there. Um, they have incredible monuments. They're always into monuments. So you drive around Quezon City where I was and around Manila. There's these huge monuments that the Philippine people put up. And that was just beautiful, great, great memories. But I saw something else that had a deep impact, more impact than I realized at the time, and that was this. Total abject poverty. This is what I saw. I saw people that were cooking on rocks. Rice, that's all they had. They had no vegetables, they had no meat. Rice was what they had, and they ate it day in and day out. I saw these squatter villages. 
right up here. I served in them. I taught people in them. One of the memories I have was teaching a lady in a, in a house that was no bigger than the width of my arms. I could stretch my arms out and touch all four walls. And, and she lived on the railroad track. So in the middle of our discussion, here comes this train. So we had to stop for you know, 10 minutes while the train went through because we couldn't hear a thing because we were this far away from the train. And that was, that was poverty. And I really got a, a good taste of it and it left an impression in my mind and in my heart. And it's what I call this burning seed. I didn't know what to do with it at the time, but it was definitely there. And w so, so the way I translated this was there's this cash highway, this river through the world. And there are certain cities that are lucky enough to be placed on it. New York, Paris, Saudi Arabia, you know, Utah County, Salt Lake County. We're kind of right around this area, right on the river. And then there's the poorest of the poor. And they are pushed away from that cash flow highway. And they can't get to it. And it's not their fault, they just they can't get to it. So what's the re result? They're in this barren wasteland that's called the poorest of the poor. And we're going to use this as an illustration through the presentation. So I go on, I have a family, we just had our sixth child, we're happy, life is great. Uh, but the seed that was planted still burns. And the question in my mind is, how can I possibly help? What can I do? Now the question is, can you relate to this? You have these feelings in your heart of, I want to help, but what can I do? So here's a story of the curve. Okay, the story of a man who helped. His name is Warren Buffett, very wealthy man. I came across this article where Warren Buffett gave $37.4 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's a big chunk of money, can do a lot of good. I thought, wow, that's, that's more than I can offer right now, you know? That'd be nice if I had, you know, a hundredth of that, but I don't. But let's just look at what, uh, what this looks like. So, uh, Mr. Buffett from Omaha, Nebraska, what he did is he took this cash flow river, or this cash flow highway, and he diverted a portion of it because he had that amount to divert. And he created this little path that goes to the poorest of the poor. Nice philosophy. So that's great. We have other programs, other examples like that. We have governmental organizations, charity organizations, humanitarian projects, fundraisers, so on. Those are all the things that can create and can divert this little finger from the river. And it's wonderful. The problems and limitations by that is your reach is limited to your inlet size. Now on his in his example, it's $37.4 billion. So he creates this, but he's limited by this, and we're limited by this because we don't have $37.4 billion. Other thing is, this taking water out diminishes from the source. So you're, taking, you're, you're not returning anything to this little highway. Uh, there's waste along the way. I come from an engineering background, manufacturing. We always talk about waste. And if you think about the waste in giving, it's the administration costs and you get into third world governments and you start to get quite a bit of waste so that this last little finger has its limitations of how far reaching it is because of the waste along the way. Those at the very end cannot always receive the aid because it runs out and also at the end it stagnates. It creates this thing called the dole and people start to w wait for a handout because there's no accountability that they have to give anything back. So although it's a wonderful you know, gesture and it's, it's, it's fantastic, it does have its limitations, that model. And we've seen that time and time and time again. If, if it were only an issue of giving money, we would have solved poverty by now. Because we've spent... ...thing is we are also on a certain side of this particular curve. So here's that point of service that Craig was talking about. And here's Mr. Buffett and Mr. Gates over here, and they're doing their thing, and that's great, and they're helping a lot of people along the way. And that's, that is fantastic. So now the question is, what can I do? I'm on the other side of the curve, right? What can I possibly do that is, let's see, the, the question, how can I help when I'm on the left side of that point? And that's specifically what we're going to talk about right now. So limitations with us. So let's bring it down to us in this room we have a few limitations. We have an income source and we get paid from that income source, okay? And that pay is what pays our living expenses. And from those living expenses, we, hopefully, if we're faithful and good, will give 10 to 15 percent to those who are in need. 10 percent always in tithing and, you know, 5 percent more if we can on fast offerings, whatever we can do. And then someday we hope to arrive at this point of service. That's the model. That's what we're all raised to do. 
why we're going to school. Now, there is another model, and I'm going to ask a question here. There is a potential approach. Now, you're going to look at this and say, how oh, is that possible? That's impossible. That defies physics. Well, hang on. Okay, income source. Same thing. Got some income source. Now, what if you could give 80 to 100% of all your profits to others in need? Here you go. You need it. Here you go. I got it. And somehow, you can still pay for all your living expenses, and somehow you could arrive at that point of service at the same time or sooner. The question is, would you do it? If you saw that that's possible, would you do it? At this point, I will warn you, be careful on that answer because it is possible, and we'll show you how. So keep that piece of information in mind as we go through this. So this now becomes a puzzle. There's four pieces to the puzzle. Piece number one, question number one. How in the world can I give 80 to 100% when I am on the left side of the point of service? The first two pieces are you, I'm oh, sorry, the four pieces, you, microfinance, technology, and action. And that's in the handout that we gave you. So we're going to walk through each of those four pieces of this puzzle to see how does this all come together? How, does, how do we make this work? Okay, the first two pieces, you and microfinance. Let's talk about you first of all. The number one thing behind this is a passion and a desire to help. And that passion and that desire will make anything happen. We are creators in our nature. And however we let that creative power out is up to us. And there's, this class is all about how do we let that creative power out? What are our signature, strength, signature strengths? And Craig's been teaching you about that. So the number one thing you have to do is realize that inside of you somewhere is that desire and that passion. In this model, you have to have some entrepreneurial vision. So we think that that's a good match for this class because there's some relationship to the entrepreneurial classes that are going on here at BYU. So you have to have some entrepreneurial uh, venturing, and then you just have to go out and achieve it. Just be a high achiever, which all of you qualify because you're here at BYU. That's default. You are, because you're here, is evidence that you are achievers. So those are the three key pieces that we won't go further into depth because we believe that you already possess that. Okay, microfinance. Dr. Yunus started something in 1976. He got the Nobel Prize in 2006. And we're going to show you a little clip now. Can you help me with that? This is a clip of Dr. Yunus, which, by the way, do you have uh, the end sign? Oh, here it is. Anybody recognize this magazine? It's a great publication. Talks about financial strength all the time. Good. Elder Ballard talks about Dr. Eunice in this month's ensign. Wow, that's pretty neat. And we just happen to have him as well, so we're going to use this as an extra plug. Go home, read the ensign. It's good stuff. All right, so go ahead and fire up that, uh, that segment three. Perfect.
with one of his students, Dr. Eunice went around the village's jungle to see if there might be others caught in a similar trap to the loan sharks. They found 42. The total amount needed by all of them to break free was $27. <coughs> Second belief that 42 able-bodied, hard-working people couldn't find it uh, less than a dollar piece to make a living for themselves. So I gave the money from my pocket, and they were really excited about it. Uh, so I thought maybe I should try to continue this and have a permanent arrangement so that they can get this money from some source without going to the money matters. Jody Mon Khan was one of the early bombers. In December of 1979, she first learned of this new organization that would give loans even to a poor woman such as her. Today, she looks back on a different life, where every day was a struggle just to keep a roof over their heads. <laughs> She was married in 1962 at the age of 10 and had her first child when she was 15. Her husband worked as a field laborer, making less than 20 cents a day. So having enough to eat was a constant struggle. It is with difficulty that she speaks at those times. In January of 1980, Jody Mon took out her first loan with a fair amount of trepidation. It was for a total of 600 taka, or about $10. With it, she bought a rice husker and began to husk and sell rice to the local vendors. Over the next year, she worked hard to make the weekly loan payments. Jody Mon made her final payment on January 1st, 1981. For the first time in her life, she and her family were eating three meals a day. She began to look to the future with hope. During this time, Dr. Hughes was... Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. This is from a, a video, actually, uh, called Small Fortunes that was put out by BYU. And I, if you get a chance to see the whole thing or if you can get a copy of that DVD, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So if you look at what Dr. Yunus did, is he began a lending program. So let's look at how that changed this particular model. He created not a diversion of the river, he created a loop, which was incredible. If this is the cash inflow, he diverted the river to the poorest of the poor, but brought the river back and carried on. How much loss is there? None. There's no loss in the model because there's accountability to return whatever you take out. That's a totally new concept. And because of that, it created so much success, they brought 100 million people out of poverty, at which time he won the Nobel Prize for peace. Now, why for peace? When people are in poverty, what does it create? It creates friction. It creates angst. It creates these angry people that can then turn to things like terrorism. Well, that's a problem in our day. So he created a way to bring them out of poverty so they could get educations, so they could start feeling a little more fulfilled, they could have a future, and what happens is there's more peace in the world. So this model is, is very, very powerful on a global scale when you look at what he actually did. So again, going back to here, 
It doesn't diminish from the source. There's accountability. The lending is uh, directly to the poorest of the poor. So straight, one-on-one. There's no dependency on the dole because there's accountability to return what you take. A whole new model. Fantastic. Okay, so we got two pieces of the pie, of the puzzle. You and there's the micro lender. Okay, that's great. Next question. How do I become an international financial institution? All right, let's just go sign up and let's all go away from our studies and start up a financial institution. Starts with a flight to some third world country. Then you've got to go learn the language. Then you have to create a whole organization there. Then you have to find out what the poverty dynamics are. There's a lot of work in that. So how, there's, there's a big barrier. How do we actually reach that? All right, next piece of the puzzle. Technology, also known as Kiva. So if you could queue up the next video. This is now a video of Kiva. It was featured in Frontline, which is where I personally saw it for the first time. This is the first time that I was exposed to microlending, and I started to put a few of these puzzle pieces together and say, wait a minute, we have a huge opportunity here. Remember that 200 million people? So go ahead and watch this, uh, see that next piece of the puzzle. <laughs> Grace's factory got a boost when she changed the way she did business. What we used to do, we had the stones, the grinding stones. So I used to do this, just have my system and the peanut, grind them on the real stone, and then pack them out, and then get into offices to get people who would buy them. Last year, Grace was able to buy a grinding machine and a refrigerator because she received what's called a micro loan. I'm really so happy that the loan has been there so that I put up everything in place. I bought the packaging materials with that money. I bought more of the produce, that's the system and the peanuts itself, the raw one. And this really increased my sales and I feel so happy about that. Grace had options when looking for a micro loan. She could have gone to a local bank, but they often charge as much as 35% interest on such loans. Local money lenders are worse. Their interest rates are as high as 300%. Instead, Grace found her loan in a new and different way, and at a much lower interest rate. When she visits her local web cafe, there's a message waiting for her. It's from Nathan Folker, who lives in San Francisco. Uh, I do like peanut butter. I like chunky peanut butter. Um, I don't know if Grace likes chunky peanut butter. I'm glad that I could be of um, help to you. Can you purchase the uh, refrigerator? I have this in part of the video to go from this and not to chunky peanut butter. Nathan's one of a small group of lenders who loaned Grace the money she needed. So much aid. I purchased the fridge and bought the packing materials, and this has really enabled me to produce more. Excellent. I'm glad that this is a Grace came to the attention of Nathan when he found her story, along with her photograph, on the website of a San Francisco based nonprofit called Kiva. The loan amount, she asked for $475, um, which I think is pretty reasonable for starting up a uh, peanut butter business. This is Grace and Yana's entry, so it, it just tells like how much I've loaned to her and how much of my loan she's repaying. Um, As Grace's business grows, Nathan is taking the money and loaning it to others. In all, he's invested in some 70 businesses. Some of the stories are more actually follow, some of them are just like, oh, I went and visited this person and learned all about water spinach and you know, we went out on a boat and I met their kids. And so I, some of the stories are, are, are more fun. Uh, but all of the stories are asking just to follow along. The concept of Kiva is simple. Using just a credit card, a lender in the U.S. can make a small loan to an entrepreneur. What's different about Kiva is that through the web, a more direct connection is forged between lender and borrower. Olga Spira gave to a business in her native Kenya. There's a human face behind the money. It's direct contact. You almost feel like you're building a relationship with that person. You can see the people, you can see what they're trying to do, you understand it. Right. And that just really depends on what, what calls out to you. Right. People are very interested, and I'm sure our next one is going to be more than 50 people. Because everybody's like, wanting to get up to the long thing. 
That evening, the information about Molly's charcoal stall is posted. It goes halfway around the world to San Francisco. So this is the screen where you can see all the loan applications that have been uploaded to our database. Amos, the furniture maker, is in that database. Surprisingly, he may not have to wait long for a response. Average funding time is two and a half days. Um, I think that it's quite possible he will be funded by the end of the week because this one is from Africa and because of this story, even though it's a large one size. Let's see. Kiva's a small operation relying on donations. They have a staff of just seven people. Premal Shaw serves as president. Humans are fundamentally better than banks. He came to Kiva from the online money transfer company, PayPal. Banks don't value emotional returns. And so banks will charge a high interest rate to these microfinance institutions where people will be a little more forgiving. And second, banks have a cost structure. So they need to pay for the brand building, brick and mortar expenses and branches, etc. People on the internet using basically the credit card and PayPal, by the way, is providing the screen payment processing. There's really no cost uh, for an internet server with sipping coffee just to come in and lend $100 to a small business. There's something about the tangibility of this. You know, I'm helping to buy a bicycle or a chicken farm or a taxi. That, to me, felt like, you know, like if I don't get the money back, great, it's a donation. But if I do, this is great because I actually get the, I can actually leave loan the money to someone else and I can feel like a little Bill Gates Foundation or a Rockefeller Foundation in my own way. Even made a huge step and just keep connecting people from the first world to people from the third world, that you can connect people from the third world to each other. That would just be, it seems like the next step, it seems like a futuristic scenario. It's been a week since Janet Alipot came to see Amos, the furniture maker. Now, after just a few days on the Kiva site, she has news for him. The lenders have completely funded his project. Yeah. Over the next nine months, Janet will keep tabs on Amos and post updates on the Kiva website about how his business is doing. In fact, no one has ever defaulted on any loan rate by Kiva. The repayment rate, for now, stands at 100%. The success of a small business spreads throughout a community. In the Achona Quarter, new houses are being built. And Kiva is building on its success as well. It's given out more than $400,000 in loans. And what started in just one small village in Uganda has spread to 11 other countries in just its first year. Oh, wow. Now, I don't know about you, but I get all excited again when I see that. We've just found a piece of the puzzle, right? Those four pieces. This is a huge nugget that we would never have had access to to participate in what's going on in the world, which is part of that Nobel Peace Prize. We wouldn't have that if it wasn't for this idea that Kiva's put together. Wow. You've just now opened up that entire opportunity to the world. Wow. There's the 200 million people plus that we could help. So let's go and see where we are now. Okay, three pieces of the puzzle. We have one left, but let's just recap. We have you. We have micro lending as a new revolutionary thing out there. And we also now have Kiva, the technology that's going to connect the first world with the third world. That's what we are, the first world. I'm not sure. So it's a pretty powerful stuff. Okay, last piece of the puzzle. This is where I get to pass the baton to my good friend, Eric. This is now where we take action and take serious action. So without further ado, Eric Peterson. Well, I don't know if I've ever received such an applause before. Um, just a little background about me and where I'm from. Uh, I grew up uh, near Logan, a little town called Providence, Utah. Um, I went to school. Uh, 
at the University of Utah. And I got my degree as an architect. And um, I, I feel a little uncomfortable here, but I, you're, you're a pretty warm crowd, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, so I'm here to tell you about this, uh, this, this final piece. And I'll need that uh, fancy remote here to move forward. Um, so John's introduced the idea that, that we can help a lot of people around the world if we incorporate these four puzzle pieces, if you will. I'm going to talk specifically, I'm going to learn how to use this. I'm going to talk about how do I create that machine that generates this profit. Now, there's a couple of things that we'll go through, but that's the question that we're going to solve right now. And this is what John and I have been working with and working on for quite a, quite a little while now. Um, is, is this mic on? Can you hear me very well? Okay, good. So I'm going to take it off for just a second. Do you all know who Tony Robbins is? Anybody know who he is? Great motivational speaker. Tony Robbins has a, a little phrase that I really like. It's called math of action. This is action that we're talking about that we're going to need to make if we're going to make this all work. That massive action is, is a big deal. And this is what it is. Welcome to African ice. This is, the, this is the brainchild of my good friend John. We were sitting at a, at a restaurant with our wives a couple years ago, and John says, I got this crazy idea I'm going to try. And I'm like, oh, sure, John, tell me all about it. I had some entrepreneurial background myself. I started a little snowboard outerwear company when I was in college, like you guys. Um, we made coats and jackets for snowboarders, and it was a very interesting business, very hard. I learned a lot of little lessons that became very profound lessons for now. But John tells me about this crazy idea. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell shaved ice. So he comes up with this, this snow shack thing. And uh, i, I got to give you some background about snow shack in my life. I'd never had a shaved ice in my life. I didn't even know what they were. I mean, I knew conceptually what it was, but I had no idea. I'm like, uh, I think I've had a snow cone at the fair once, but that's about all I knew. So John says, no, no, this is a real business. This is something that can really grow into, into, into a thing that I want to do uh, that will help save the world. I'm like, save the world, John? It's a snow shack. What do you mean, save the world? Well, I'm gonna go, let's, let's go over this little circle here, and this is basically how it works uh, in a nutshell. We, we have a tagline, African ice, a delicious way to save the world. If you want to help someone, how about slurping down some sweet, cold beverage in the middle of a warm summertime uh, to do that? And so that's what we do, is, is we allow people to come to our snow shacks. We have multiple locations now. And participate in the micro-lending process of helping other people by enjoying a snow cone. Our customers come to us and they buy a snow cone. We give them a, a cute little token that they can take around to the side of our shack. And uh, you can kind of see right there's a yellow spot right there. A little yellow funnel. People drop those tokens into these funnels. And above each funnel, we have three. Above each funnel, we have a little bio. And we'll show you a few of those uh, in a minute. This bio is basically just an outline of, of what the person's doing for their business in Africa specifically. It's where we're focused. And... Um, so the, the customer gets to choose which one of the three, and we keep track of how many tokens each customer receives. And, and, and at, at, the, at the point where they receive enough tokens to represent the amount of their loan, we take down their little placard off the wall, and we write a big funded across it, and we slap it on the other side of our shack. So the people that come to our little snow shacks can actually see that they are affecting the lives of people across the, across the world that they've never met. And frankly, we've never met either. But that is the concept. So... The, the, the loan then goes, we were using Kiva to start with, and it, it rotates out, and they build their business, and then we receive those loans in return, and we get to build more ice stands and sell more shaved ice. So that's it in a nutshell, the business model. Let's go through this again. The revenue received is our start starting point, and we get that in our specific case, we get that through selling snow cones or shaved ice. The profit is deferred and sent as a microloan to those in need. The money is used in third world businesses. The profit is returned and paid back, and that's the point where we realize the, the profits of our business. And 
So this becomes a key point. The big, the big, uh, the big word I want you to focus on is the deferred. John and I have decided that our business is sustainable enough that we're willing to let the profits go for a period of time. Now, yes, there's opportunity cost involved in that, absolutely. But we think the benefit of losing that opportunity for our, <clears throat> excuse me, for ourselves is greatly offset by that cost. So, in essence, what I'm saying is we make a loan to Africa, and that money does its thing. It's being lent, it's being used. We pay taxes on that money. We, we go through that process, and we're like, that's okay. We're good with that. Because six to seven months later, that money comes back to us. So let's say we're making loans in, in, in the middle of summer, then our, our winters are nice. We get to have those big loans repaid to us. So that's basically how it works. And you've got to understand that, that, that the cost is, 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 or the benefits far outweigh the cost if you put it in the right perspective. And that's, that's our cycle. It depends on, there's a few factors, but there's a cycle of, of uh, a few months. This is basically our growth. Um, 2007, John was alone on the, on the shack. Uh, I, I, I did participate a little bit. I have a, have a son who's eight, eight years old at the time. Uh, he got to mix the sugar water on our back patio for the, uh, for, for the snow cones. That was his summer job. He really thought that was cool. He bought a lot of Legos, and I guess that's okay, too. But um, so we had, the start was one, one, uh, one, one shack. We grew to six the next year. Uh, that was last summer. Uh, that was a big jump from one to six. I think, I think my, my architectural background was really, really utilized quite a bit in the construction and the design of our shacks um, because John needed some help. I could see if he was going to grow, he needed some serious help. And so we worked on it. Over the winter time. we made some design uh, decisions and, and moved from, from one to six. This next year, we have a goal of having eight shacks. What's interesting is the number of people we've helped. There's 15 to start with. We figured we helped about 100 families last year, last season, and now we have a goal of 300 and maybe more. Depends on how things go, but, you know, the activity was just an idea to start with. Pilot run, it worked. This is, and right here, the holy cow, that, that's another word for massive action. It took a huge effort to go from here to here. And I don't want to make it sound like it's impossible, but it certainly takes commitment. And I want to make, emphasize that very clearly, because this is a business. This is not a, 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 uh, an idea that's fun and, and you, you want to do on the side. Of course, we are working at it and, and growing it as, as a secondary business of, or secondary source of income for ourselves, but it is absolutely a business, and you ought to treat it that way. Um, we, we treat... Our, our business decisions are based upon profitability, logistics, and, and, uh, and our goals as individuals, uh, whatever we want to do. So that holy cow, you can substitute in that Tony Robbins massive action thing. Um, and now we're refining and growing, and we're in that process right now of deciding where we want to be in the future and, and how we want to grow through this. So anyway, that's it. That's piece number four, the small business. Now, you all have the chance to think about a small business, perhaps, and to follow in our footsteps. Our idea is hopefully uh, seen by others and other businesses, and I figure any business could probably take on at least a portion of this business model. Um, we're deferring profits, okay? That's above and beyond our expenses. Our employees don't work for free. We don't ask them to say, can you wait six months for your paycheck? That's not our process at all. We want to make sure that we cover all of our expenses. The profit, the margin above and beyond our expenses is the thing that we share with the folks in Africa and throughout the world. And so if, if a business is truly profitable, any business could take part in this if they were willing to defer their, the realization of their profits for a set period of time. And our hope is, is that people will look at that and say, yeah, that's a great idea. I'd like to participate. So... We come back to this. The traditional approach, we, we get a job and we, we get paid, we pay our living expenses, we give a little bit, and we arrive at the point of service. John and I are looking at this a little more differently. Uh, this income service or income source is, is our shaved ice business. We give 80 to 100% of the profits to others in need. Now, keep in mind that John and I still have our day jobs. 
we're hoping, and our, our dream is, that this becomes our full-time job. And so we're leveraging this small business with the time that we have, and hopefully it grows into a business that can consume all of our time, if that's the right word, um, but something that provides for our needs and our family. And so we're hopeful that this eventually goes into paying our living expenses and we can arrive at this point of service. At a, at, at, I, I think same time might be a little underestimating what it can be, but I expect that we could be able to do this full-time in, in the next few years. And at that point, we've, we've, we've leveraged ourselves, we've kind of bootstrapped ourselves, at the same time, lifting a bunch of people out of poverty, and, and we have this, this fun business, and, and we're having a great time at it. So that is the small business is what it does. It sets to defer the profits via microloans. So come back to the question. Now, this is one of our placards. Come back to that original question. If we told you and we gave you an idea of how to do this, would you do it? Come back to that question in your mind. You've now been given a little bit of a glimpse of what can happen. I don't want to sugarcoat the fact that it takes effort, and it is a business. You're all here in business school because you want to do this kind of thing. It's definitely effort involved. But this is the result. This is Kellen. She's 30 years old. I get a little emotional about this one. You know, um, Kellen has a, an interesting idea. She wants to educate all of these kids. This is her business, her school. And I have actually, I, I have this, this posted at my desk at wet work, and everybody walks by and says, what is that? And I explain, well, this, this is our logo. This is African Ice, and, and this is what, what we do and how it works. And, and I've had people at work really, really uh, kind of catch the, catch the vision of it. But her loan amount was for $328. She wants to... Her family, uh, she's now been able to purchase a piece of land where she plans to build a permanent school to better help herself, her children, and all the children of the community. 328 bucks is going to do that? Absolutely. That's what her needs are. You know, I, you know that's a, a decent car payment for us. And, and, and that, that helps this whole community. Anyway, I'm going to share with you a couple more. This woman here, uh, she owns a five-star restaurant. Um, she cooks and, uh, on the street and has a good time doing that. And, and she, she needs a loan. Again, her loan mount for $328. Uh, a lot of these, these people that we share our resources with have a desire to educate their family, their children, and people around them. This woman has a coconut business. I didn't know there was a such thing as a coconut business, but apparently she has one. And we're happy to help her. She's one that she's looking for. She's looking for $165. That's what she needs. And, and, and again, the repayment period, six months. And she's going to use the loan. So this is one of those, these are examples of the placards on the side of our shack that we allow people to drop the coins in, the tokens in, so that they can uh, get their micro loans and, and move forward in their businesses, helping themselves and helping their communities. So... Step by step, I'm going to back up so I can read these with you. Have a desire. That's, that's the most important thing, is having that desire, to have the fuel to move forward with this. And then I, right after that, I would say that massive action thing obviously is there. Pray for guidance. You, you're entitled to personal revelation whatever you, for whatever you want to do. If you have ideas about a business, please think about it. Pray about it. Find out if it's something that you feel like you can reasonably do. And then develop a plan. Figure out how you're going to do that deferred profit thing for 4 to 12 months. Whatever it is. We've given you some ideas there. Whatever it may be. Create a Kiva account. Now, you could do this in about 30 minutes right after this class. If you have a credit card and you want to put 25 bucks towards some loan, you could do that right away. There's nothing, nothing keeping you from that at all. Create an advertising campaign, develop a business, raise awareness. We're trying to do that. I mean, obviously, we're here, you know, presenting this this um, this presentation today. But we'd love for you all to have a shaved ice too. We didn't bring our shavers down today, unfortunately. But but maybe in the summertime, if you run by one of these these shacks and say, "I know what those guys are doing. Maybe I'll, I'll have a shaved ice." So uh, we created the business. It it it's a business. Again, it just takes time, it takes effort. 
And then you're going to change lives. And you're going to feel a sense of satisfaction you never felt before. Because you are actively and anxiously engaged in a good cause. This is our closing thought. I want you to read this. Read this carefully. If you can internalize that statement, and the Lord called His people Zion because they are of one heart, one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. We can do it. It's not going to happen overnight. It may take a generation or two. But we can do it. Thank you. Again, if you guys have questions and just want to... Yeah, please stay after. We'll, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have.